Welcome to an ILMQuest presentation. presentation. Basic Fiqh, Purification and Salah, presented by Yasser Qazi, part two. Part, two. part two. We now move on to wudu and the procedure of wudu. Uh, firstly, let's discuss what are the situations or what are the acts that require wudu. In other words, what acts are a wudu shart of? Right? What are those acts that you need to have wudu before you perform them? Obviously, the first one which everybody knows is prayer. Wudu, right, is a shart for prayer. The Prophet ﷺ said, Allah does not accept the prayer of any one of you if he has broken his wudu until he performs his wudu. Okay, and this is something everybody knows. There's no difference between about this at all. The second act which requires wudu before you do it is the tawaf. And obviously, the umrah as well. But uh, the Umrah only because of the Tawaf. When you're doing an Umrah, you also have to do Sa'i, as you know. The Sa'i does not require you to have Wudu. Only the Tawaf requires you to have Wudu. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the Tawaf around the Kaaba is like Salah. So from this, the scholars have derived that because it's like Salah, this then means that it has the same preconditions as Salah. And of those preconditions is Wudu. And the third situation or act that requires Wudu is to touch the Qur'an. To touch the Mus'haf, this is what requires wudu, not to recite. You can recite the Qur'an when you're not in the state of wudu. But in order to touch the Mus'haf, you have to have wudu. The Prophet ﷺ said that no one should touch the Qur'an unless he is tahir, meaning in the state of wudu. Unless he has purified himself, meaning he is in the state of wudu. These are the three acts and the only three acts that require wudu. Anything else... It is not a requirement, it is not a shart to have wudu. There are many things which is mustahab if you do wudu before it. But the shart, the only three acts that have as a shart before them that you have wudu are these three things. Salah, tawaf, and touching the Qur'an. What is the procedure of wudu? Let's list the arkan of wudu. What are the arkan? Who can tell me a rukun? What is a rukun again? A rukun is an... Essential component. Without it, you do not have that act. So these are the arkan. These are the acts. If you do not do even one of them, you have not performed wudu. Doesn't matter whether you forgot it, whether you did it intentionally, didn't do it. If you did not do any of these acts of the arkan, your wudu is not valid and acceptable to Allah. The first is to have the intention to do wudu. Okay, you have to have the intention. You want to have done wudu. So if someone is, for example, walking in the rain and he gets wet and then after the rain finishes, he goes, oh, okay, I might as well have done wudu then. And he thinks he has wudu. No. Or also, for example, it's very common psychologically. Even for me, sometimes you come home from a hot day. You automatically, you just want to wash yourself from the sweat. You automatically wash yourself in the way of wudu without thinking that you wanted to do wudu. Because you're so ingrained to doing wudu that you just start doing it without realizing that you want to do it. If someone were to do the entire act without having the intention of doing it for the sake of Allah or for wudu, then it would not count as wudu because the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Actions are by intentions. The second rukun is to wash the face in its entirety. And the face is defined to be from the tip of the forehead to the chin and from the ears to the ears. Okay? The top of the forehead where the hair commonly grows, commonly because if someone is bald, then that doesn't mean he has to go all the way back here. Where the hair commonly grows, the forehead, all the way down to the chin, this is the, the, from top to bottom. And from right to left, it is from the ear to the ear. This is the face. So water must touch the entire face. If a person has a thick beard, then it is not necessary that the skin become wet. He just must make the outer portion of his beard wet. Meaning he just must do like this and the water will touch the outward portion. If he has a thin beard or no beard, then he must make sure the water touches these areas of his face. The third rukun is to wash the hands all the way to the elbows, including the elbows. When we say until the elbows, Allah says until the elbows, He means up to and including the elbows. So you must wash it from the fingertips to the elbows. Now many people when they start the wudu, they wash their hands. Then when they get to wiping or washing the arm, they start from their wrist, believing that they have already washed their hands. But that washing at the beginning doesn't absolve them of this rukun. You understand this? The rukun means at this point in time, you need to wash your entire limb from finger, the tips of the finger, all the way down to the elbow. 
This is the third rukun, is to wash the entire arm, actually would be more appropriate instead of hand, the word. The fourth is to wipe the head. So you wet your hands and you just wipe the head. And the head is defined to be from where the face finished until the back of the neck, the nape of the neck. And included in the wipe of the head is the ears. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, the two ears are a part of the head. Al-udhunani min al-ras. Therefore, when you wipe the head, then you must also wipe the ears as well. This is of the rukuns. The fifth rukun is to wash the feet. And the feet includes up to the ankles, including the ankles as well. The sixth is that you must do it in this order. So if you wash your hands and then wash your face, this does not count. You must do it in this specific order. And the last is that you must do all of these six acts within a reasonable amount of time. So you wake up in the morning, you wash your face. And then when time for dhuhr comes, you then start washing your hands thinking you've washed your face in the morning. No. You have to do it within a reasonable period of time. And the scholars state, I mean, as an example, that uh, each limb should still be wet by the time you get to the next limb. I mean, it just means within five minutes, ten minutes, finish all of these acts. Okay, what is the evidence for these arkan? The evidence, all of them, is found in the Quran. Allah says in Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse six: Ya ayu al-ladina amanu, O you who believe, ida qumtum ila salah, when you intend to pray. Okay, faghsilu wujuhakum, wash your faces when you intend to pray. Ida qumt, when you stand up to pray, this shows you must have had the intention. You must have the intention. That's why you're going to do wudu. So that's the first one. It's not, the word intention is not mentioned in the Qur'an, but it's understood. Because Allah says, when you want to pray, do this. Meaning, you must have in your mind, you're doing this for a reason. Okay? Do what? فَغْسِلُوا وَجُوهَكُمْ Wash your face. وَأَيْدِيَكُمْ إِلَى الْمَرَافِقِ And your hands to your elbows. This is the third one. Right? وَمْسَحُوا And wipe your heads. وَأَرْجُلَكُمْ إِلَى الْكَعْبَيْنِ And wash your feet until the ankles. So, so far, everything is explicitly mentioned. Where do we get the order from? The sixth part. The order firstly because it is mentioned like this in the Quran. And secondly, and this is a bit complicated, so if you don't understand, no big deal. If you notice, Allah says, wash the hands. And then He says, wipe the head. And then He says, wash the feet. So the washings, the two washings have been interspersed with a wiping. Okay. Now, it is a part of the eloquence of the Arabic language that when you have a certain list of things, you list similar ones together, and dissimilar ones separately, unless you want to make a point. So the fact that Allah separates the two washings and puts a wiping in the middle, shows you that He wants to make a point. If you wanted to just put a list, you would say, wash the hands and the feet, and wipe the head. You would summarize. Okay, if, if you understand this, alhamdulillah, if not, then you know it's a technical point of the Arabic language, but the fact that Allah mentions the two washings in between he places a wiping, which is separate from the washing. Shows you that he wants to show an emphasis of this order. Also the fact that the Prophet ﷺ would always do wudu in this specific order shows you that this is part of the rukuns of the wudu. And the last shart or the last sorry, rukun is that you do it over a period of time. This is because Allah says when you desire to pray, do these things. Meaning that you have to do it before that prayer comes. So not you do one thing in the morning, the next in the afternoon, the next in the evening. It has to be within a reasonable amount of time. Also what proves this is that the Prophet ﷺ once saw a man who had left the back portion of his feet, the heels, he had left them dry. Only this amount, small amount, a coin's a circumference. So he said, go back and repeat your prayer and your wudu. He had prayed while not having washed his uh, place of the feet. He didn't just say, go wash your feet. He said, because such a long time had passed, go back and repeat your prayer and your wudu. So the fact that he had to repeat his wudu shows you that if you do not do these six acts or these five acts within a reasonable amount of time, you have to go back and repeat the entire wudu again. Also, it is very important that no body part that is mentioned here is left dry. Because whoever leaves it dry has come under the punishment of Allah. Once the Sahaba were performing wudu quickly, the time for prayer was leaving. So they were doing it quickly, they were leaving portions of their feet dry. The Prophet ﷺ said, Woe to the backs of the feet from the fire of hell. In other words, translating it metaphorically, Be careful if you continue this way, the fire of hell will touch those places you didn't perform wudu on. Because they were being careless, they were being quick about it.
Okay, and unfortunately, this is a very common mistake that many Muslims make. They just do wudu quickly, and they might have big portions of their hands still dry here, or portions of their face their water didn't touch. You must make sure that every single area that it is obligatory to touch water, it touches. Water touches it. Else, if this becomes your habit, then the Prophet ﷺ said, "Beware of the fire of hell, because you are being careless, sloppy." Uh, what type of you know de de dedication and devotion does that show? These are the seven arkan of wudu. What are the sunan of wudu? First, to say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim before you start. Then to wash the hand three times up to the wrists. Okay, this is a sunnah of wudu. Then to gargle and wash the nose. Okay, and this is a strong sunnah because the Prophet ﷺ commanded us to do it. And he said, exaggerate in washing the nose. Exaggerate meaning do your best to, to clean the nose. And how does one do this? You take the water with your right hand and with one swoop of the hand, you take a little bit of water in your mouth and then the rest of it you sniff up. Literally, you just sniff it up. Okay, as much as you can. Now for the first few weeks, if you really try doing this, it's going to burn your nose. But after you get used to it, you will realize that this cleans your nose, you know, very nicely. And from what I understand, Allah knows best that some doctors in Medina have told me that this prevents a lot of diseases, a lot of, a lot of types of cancer as well, because it cleans the nose in a very precise and, uh, you know, pure way. And if anybody starts in going, doing this as a practice and, a, and as a habit, he will realize this for himself. So what you do is you blow the water up like this. You literally blow it up and then you blow it out and you take it out with your left hand. You use your right hand to take it in and you use your left hand to take it out following the principles of the Sharia that the, the, the good and the pure with the right and the impure to clean it with the left. This also is a part of the Sunan and the Prophet ﷺ said, like we said, exaggerate in cleaning the nose unless you are fasting. Because if you're fasting and you try to clean the nose, the water will be swallowed into your mouth and that will break your wudu. So if you're fasting, then don't exaggerate. Still do it, but don't exaggerate in doing it. Also of the sunan is to repeat each of these acts of washing the face and the hands and the feet three times. It suffices to do it once. The Prophet ﷺ washed it once. Sometimes he washed it twice. Most of the time he washed three times. Except for the wiping of the head, this is always done once. This is always done once. Uh, the next sunnah is the takhleel of the beard and fingers. Takhleel means to go in between. Take these hands and fingers and go between the beard. And also between the fingers and toes, take the two hands and wash in between the fingers. Also in between the toes. Take a finger and go in between the toes to make sure that it is even more clean. The Prophet would regularly do this as well. Also of the sunnah is you wash the right limb before the left when that exists, such as the hands and the feet. It is a sunnah to wash the right before the left. To do otherwise is makruh. And of the sunan is to do dhikr after wudu. What is the dhikr after wudu? Ashadu wa la ilaha illa. Illallahu wa la sharika la. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasulu. The Prophet said whoever does this, then the eight doors of Jannah will be open for him. And that is a very great blessing for such a short and such an easy thing to do. So these are uh, the sunan of wudu. And also of the sunan which is uh, of wudu and of all times is the sunan of using the miswak or the siwak. And in our times, a toothbrush or whatever, the Prophet ﷺ would regularly use the miswak. And he said, were it not for the fact that it would have been too much of a hardship or difficulty for my ummah, I would have made the miswak obligatory after every wudu. So this is something we should try to do. And if we don't have the miswak, anything that cleans the mouth as well, like the toothbrush or whatever, it is very strongly encouraged. The Prophet ﷺ would use it continuously before entering the house, before entering the masjid, before reciting Quran. He would use the siwak and his mouth would always be fresh and clean. What are some of the factors that nullify wudu? Or in fact, all of the factors that nullify wudu. What are these factors? Number one, any discharge from one's private parts. Any discharge, anything that comes out from the front or the back private part, this breaks the wudu. This is especially important with regards to the sisters. They have a certain type of discharge that occurs to them frequently. Even this discharge of that fluid, it breaks the wudu. Because it is a discharge from the private parts. Another thing that breaks the wudu is deep sleep. If a person falls asleep and he loses consciousness in his sleep, a deep sleep, that breaks his wudu. And obviously, unconsciousness, if a person falls into a coma as well. Now realize, sleep in and of itself does not break wudu. What breaks wudu is to pass wind. But when you are asleep, you do not know if you have passed wind or not. This is why unconsciousness and deep sleep breaks wudu. You're following. In and of itself, sleep does not break wudu. Sleep is not a factor that breaks wudu. But when you go to sleep, it is very likely, very common that you will pass wind and you will not realize it. So the Prophet ﷺ said 
that the eye, I'm translating metaphorically the hadith because it's an example or parable in Arabic, the eye acts like a check over one's private parts in terms of releasing wind or not. So if the eye is open, then the private part is secure. And if the eye falls asleep, then the private part becomes loose. Meaning that when you lose consciousness, either in sleep or in a coma, then it is possible that you will break your wudu by passing wind. Therefore, any deep sleep breaks the wudu. Now, this issue, the issue of sleep, is one in which there's, I think, 10 opinions over the scholars because there's so many ahadith regarding them. The Sahaba would go to sleep and the snores would be heard from them and then they would stand up and pray. You know, and so many ahadith. So the best uh, solution or the best opinion by combining all of these ahadith seems to be that if you fall asleep in such a way that you do not know whether you broke wind or not, then you have broken your wudu. As for the hadith that the Sahaba would fall asleep and snores would be coming from them, they would fall asleep in the masjid waiting for the Prophet ﷺ with their backs to the wall, okay? And they just like fall asleep and then wake up. So if your back is to the wall and your buttocks are on the ground, then and there, it is not likely that you will break wind in this position. And also for a few minutes you fall asleep and wake up. It is not likely. So because of this then, the, the fact that they fell asleep is ignored. But to fall asleep into a deep sleep where you lose consciousness, then this is a factor that breaks wudu. Remember again, not in and of itself, but because you might have passed wind while you were unconscious or asleep. Another thing that breaks the wudu is to touch the private parts. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever touches his private part, let him do wudu. Okay, whoever touches his private part. To touch it means to touch it with your hand. If for example, you're taking a shower and you're, uh, you know, uh, maybe like the, this portion of your hand, like your arm touches the private part, this does not break wudu. Touching with your hands, this is what breaks wudu. And whether you touch your own private part or the private part of your wife, for example, or the doctor if he has to examine, anything of this nature, if you touch another person's private parts, this breaks your wudu. Um, with regards to mothers changing their, the diapers of their children and they have to touch their private parts, um, in my opinion, this does not break the wudu because uh, of the fact that this is something that uh, would have been very common in the process and would have informed them had this broken the wudu. Also because of the fact that this is of a child who is a very young age and there is a strong necessity to, to do so. And this is also the opinion of many of the ulama that there is an exception in that situation. That when the mother is changing the diapers and, or even the father is changing the diapers and he happens to touch his private part, this is ignored and excused. Another thing that breaks the wudu is to eat camel's meat because the Prophet ﷺ was asked, should we do wudu after eating, cow's meat, uh, after eating sheep's meat? He said no. Then he was asked, should we do wudu after eating camel's meat? He said yes. So to eat a camel's uh, flesh also breaks the wudu. So if you ever happen to travel to these countries, Arabia or something, and eat a camel, then that will break your wudu. Other factors do not nullify the wudu. Although sometimes wudu is recommended. For example, if you vomit or if you bleed from a place other than the private parts. Okay, it is encouraged to do wudu, but wudu in and of itself is not nullified. Okay. Uh, suppose there's a najis substance on the floor and you clean that substance and in the process you touched it. Does that break your wudu? I just said other factors do not nullify. So if you touch najis, it does not break your wudu. If you touch najis, it does not break your wudu. Okay? All you have to do is to wash your hands and get the najis off of you. Releasing najis breaks the wudu. Urinating and defecating breaks the wudu. But touching it does not break the wudu. Touching nudges, you only have to wash the hands. No scholar says that if you touch nudges, your wudu is broken. Because you did not release anything, you did not do anything. You just touched it, so that portion of your body becomes nudges. You must only clean that portion of the body and move on. If a person is in the state of wudu and is uh, unsure whether he broke it or not, then he builds his ruling upon the certainty of the situation and not upon doubt. So, for example, a person knows for sure he has performed wudu for the Luhar prayer. It's time for Asr. He doesn't remember if he broke his wudu or not. But he's sure he performed wudu for dhuhr. He bases the ruling upon the certainty, which means that he assumes he has wudu. Because he is certain he performed it. And he's doubtful if he broke it. So in the sharia, there's a general rule. You build upon certainty and you ignore doubt. This is a general rule applies everywhere. And it applies here as well. The opposite is true. He knows he went to the restroom at a certain time. And he's unsure that he did wudu after it. Then he assumes... He doesn't have wudu, okay? So you build upon the certainty and you ignore any doubts after that. These are the factors that nullify wudu. Nothing else nullifies wudu besides this.
Some ulama have a lot of other things, but there is no strong evidence for it. Some ulama say touching women with desire, for example, breaks the wudu. Okay? Uh, this is not true because the Prophet ﷺ would kiss Aisha and then go to the masjid and lead them in prayer. And kissing is an act that is done by desire. It's not touching even. Those scholars said if you touch with desire. Others said if you only touch it breaks your wudu. Here we have an authentic hadith in Bukhari Muslim that the Prophet would kiss Aisha and then go to the masjid and lead them in prayer. Okay. Now suppose you kissed and touched and some pre-seminal fluid came out. Now what? Now your wudu breaks. Right? Why? Because that's number one, any discharge. So what breaks the wudu is not the act of touching or kissing, but it is the desire that follows which causes the man, you know, to have that and then the pre-seminal fluid comes out. This is what breaks the wudu, not the act in and of itself. Okay? Also, when the pre-seminal fluid comes out, this is najis, right? Remember we said that is najis. What must one do then? Is it sufficient that one performs wudu? No. Because that's najis on his body. So he has to wash the area as well. Ali radiallahu anhu asked the Prophet about the priest and food. He said, I would get a lot. He was a young man. He said, I would get this a lot. So he complained to the Prophet What he would do was that he used to take a shower every time. For priest and food. Because he thought that this is what they had to do. He goes, I kept on taking showers until my back began to hurt because of the cold. You know. So then finally out of embarrassment, because Ali was the, was the son-in-law of the Prophet ﷺ, out of embarrassment, finally he went and asked. So the Prophet ﷺ said, wash your private parts with water, okay, and do wudu. This is a factor that because the pre fluid comes out and it is najis, and this is, the brothers must be aware of this because it's something very common, it's not sufficient to do wudu. Unlike urine and, and, and defecation, because we, we don't do that, you know, in, in our clothes, we, we, we wash it, we don't think about pre-seminal fluid though. Pre-seminal fluid is only a few drops and it's discharged in our clothes usually. If it is a significant amount, and every person knows what is significant versus insignificant for himself. Obviously insignificant, and you do not, you cannot feel it, you're not aware of it. This is ignored, don't let the waswas of shaitan come to you. But if you feel it and you know that pre-seminal fluid came, then it is not sufficient to do wudu. You must go wash yourself, wash your undergarments as well, that area that is affected, not all of it, just the area that is affected, okay, and then do wudu after that. This also then leads us to wiping over the socks, because this is an integral uh, part of wudu when, when we are allowed to do so. When are we allowed to wipe over the socks? We're allowed to perform masah over any foot covering, masah is the wiping, any foot covering. Any covering that covers the foot, whether it's a big shoe, whether it's a, a sandal that covers most of the foot, whether it's a sock, a thick sock, anything that covers the foot in its entirety. The key factor here is that it must cover the foot, ankles including, and then down from there. So if you're wearing uh, jogging shoes, for example, that are below the ankles, and you're not wearing socks, this does not qualify. You cannot do masah. Why? Because your ankles are exposed. And you must wash the ankles in wudu. So the fact that you're leaving a portion that needs to be washed exposed means that you cannot have the luxury of doing masah. Masah is only allowed when you wear a foot covering that covers the area that you have to wash in its entirety. Okay. Now here some scholars have so many different conditions but none of these conditions have really any evidence. Any foot covering, a thin sock, a thick sock, any type of sock qualifies to do masah over. Unless there is only one exception, the sock can be considered not to exist. For example, uh, the, the women's thing that the non-Muslim women wear, wear uh, that type of sock. What do you call it? The, the stockings. These type of stockings, because they're translucent and transparent and so thin, right? this doesn't really qualify as a sock. Okay? But anything, even the dress socks that the men wear, this is a sock. This covers. And it is thick enough to qualify as a sock, so you can perform masah over this type of foot covering, like we said, as long as the entire foot is covered. If you wear a sandal, which doesn't cover uh, the ankles, okay, then this doesn't qualify. If you wear a shoe that doesn't cover the ankles, it doesn't qualify. If you wear a shoe that does cover the ankles, a type of boot or a type of, of big shoe, some of the shoes, they go up to the ankles, that's fine. You can do masah over those shoes. Otherwise, if you're wearing shoes and socks, then uh, the masah is done over the uh, socks and not the shoes. Because it is the socks that cover the uh, the foot. The time period that masah is allowed is three days for the traveler and one for all others. So if you're traveling, 
Okay, now remember in those days, you know, they would be wearing very thick shoes, special shoes that they would wear for traveling, and they wouldn't take them off at all. Obviously, in our times, that doesn't happen anymore, but the Prophet allowed this concession three days for the traveler and 24 hours, one day for those who are not traveling. When does this time start? We say 24 hours, okay? Suppose you uh, performed wudu at 7 o'clock, okay? Then you broke wudu, you broke your wudu at 8 o'clock. And then you did your first masah at 9 o'clock. Just for, for, for you to understand. When does that time break the next day? 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, or 9 o'clock? 7, 9. Is there any 8? What, does it start? When does the timing start is the question. Does it start when you did wudu? In fact, if you want to be even more specific, we can go one more step. Does it start when you do wudu? Does it start when you put the sock on? Does it start when you break the wudu? Or does it start when you perform masah for the first time? Four different opinions. Okay, there's four different opinions here. Suppose you did wudu at seven, and you you were in the state of wudu until eight. Then you put your socks on at eight. Okay, and then at nine you broke your wudu, and then at ten you did your first masah. So there's seven, eight, nine, ten. Now the time period starts from when you break your wudu. This is the strongest opinion, from when you break it. Why? Because that's where the concession starts. You didn't have, you didn't need the concession before you. While you're in the state of wudu, you don't need the concession. The concession starts when you break the wudu. So if you perform wudu at 7 o'clock, and then you broke your wudu after dhuhr, then you're allowed to perform masah till the next dhuhr, the next day. And not necessarily till 7 o'clock the next day. Because the timing, this 24 hours or this 3 days, it starts when you first break the wudu. Now obviously there's only one condition to performing masah, and that is that you must wear the socks in the state of wudu, or the shoes, whatever you're wearing, in the state of wudu. Once Jabir radiallahu anhu was with the Prophet sallallahu and he was giving him water to do wudu, so when it came time to wash his feet, the Jabir came down to take his shoes off, the Prophet said, leave them, for I wore them while I had wudu. And then he wiped over them. Okay, so the condition is that you must have worn your shoes or your socks in the state of wudu. Did you have to have the intention to do masah when you wore your socks? Suppose you wake up in the morning for fajr, you, you perform fajr, you, you, you prayed fajr, and then you put your socks on, and then you go to work. Come time for dhuhr, and you remember that you had wudu, you put your socks on, but you put them on without the intention that you're going to perform masah for dhuhr. Is it allowed for you to perform masah for dhuhr? Yes, it is, because it's not a prerequisite that you have your niyyah when you put your socks on. It is not a prerequisite. The only prerequisite is you put your socks on or your shoes on in the state of wudu. One last point, the Prophet ﷺ also allowed masah over wrapped turbans. And by qiyas, by analogy, we can then state that this is also allowed for our sister's hijabs. Because it's the same thing. The Prophet ﷺ, when he was wearing a wrapped turban, wrapped, not a topi, not, a, not just a, a, a head cap, a turban which is difficult to uh, unfold, he would just wash this part of the head and then wipe over the remaining portion. Because this part is easy, you can move the turban back, wash it like this, and, or excuse me, wipe it like this, and then wipe over the turban. Okay? So it is permissible to wipe over uh, the turban, and the point to benefit for our times in particular is the hijabs of our sisters when they are in a place where they really don't want to take it off, or if it's, you know, and this hijab has to be bound, not the loose hijab, which obviously isn't shutter in the first place, but because it's loose, they have to take it off. The point is the wrapped turban, which means something which is difficult to take off. So if they have wrapped a scarf around themselves or they have put it firmly in place, then they are exempt from taking the hijab off and they are allowed to wipe the head until the back without necessarily taking the, the hijab off. Um, the, the wiping, for the sister's sake, only has to be till the back of the neck and not obviously the entire hijab. This is the fiqh of wiping over the socks. Okay, suppose, or uh, the next topic after the uh, wudu obviously is ghusl. What is ghusl obligated by? When do you have to do ghusl? Ghusl is obligated by number one, a discharge of semen itself. And this is for the man, for the woman, the discharge of her uh, fluid at the time of orgasm. Whatever that fluid is called, is definitely not, what is it called? Does anybody know? Is there a special name for it? I don't know the name. There's a, cer a certain fluid that is expelled or discharged, just like for the man it is discharged, so too for the woman. That discharge of the fluid, whether it's for the man or for the woman, okay, that discharge obligates ghusl. Whether it was in a wet dream or in a state of awakeness or in a state of sleeping, it doesn't matter. When that discharge occurs, then ghusl is obligated. The next thing which obligates ghusl is touching of the two private parts that should be. Touching of the two private parts, 
when the man's private part touches the woman's private part and enters it, not necessarily outward touching. The man's private part must enter, even if it's only a small amount, the woman's private part. Even if no discharge, no, no ejaculation occurs, if the two, like the Prophet ﷺ said, if the two circumcised objects, or the two circumcised parts touch one another, then ghusl is obligated. Okay? So even if discharge does not occur, ghusl is obligated. Now this is, uh, we have to be explicit here, and this is something, we, you know, like the, like the Prophet said, Allah is not embarrassed by the truth. We have to say it very explicitly, if the man's part only touches the external portion of the woman's part and does not enter it, this does not obligate ghusl. If he does not make his object enter the woman's private part, then this does not obligate ghusl. Only if he enters her, even if it's a little bit, this is what obligates ghusl. The next, uh, the third thing which obligates ghusl is the acceptance of Islam. When a person accepts Islam, then he should take a, a bath because the Prophet ﷺ, when a Sahabi came to him and said, he, La ilaha illallah Rasulullah, he said, go take a bath and uh, become circumcised. So he obligated him to take a bath. Another uh, aspect which obligates ghusl is the menses or the nifas, the childbirth, uh, blood that is released after the child is born. These two types of blood, when the woman has them, she must take a bath after they finish. Also, death, meaning that when a person dies, a Muslim dies, then uh, the other Muslims must give him a bath unless he is shaheed, in which case that is exempt from him. Otherwise, when a person dies, then it is obligatory to give him a, death, uh, a bath after uh, that. When a person is in the state of Janaba, when a person does one of these things, when he touches the, or when he enters the private part or when he discharges semen, those two things, and he's in a state of Janaba or in the state of menses for the woman, what is he prohibited from doing? What are the acts that he cannot do? Well, obviously, everything that needs wudu is also prohibited automatically because he can't have wudu. So the prayer and the tawaf and what was the third thing? Touching the Quran is prohibited for the woman in her menses and nifas and the man in the state of janaba. One more thing that is prohibited is the recitation of the Quran. Recitation. When you are in the state of janaba, you are not allowed to recite the Quran. But you can do dhikr. You can say Alhamdulillah, Subhanallah, Astaghfirullah because Aisha said that the Prophet ﷺ would mention Allah at all times. What is prohibited is to recite the Qur'an, even from memory. Because the Qur'an is so holy that to recite it, at least get out of the state of Janaba. You don't have to have wudu. And to touch it, you need to have wudu. Uh, another thing which is prohibited by Janaba and uh, by Mensa Zanifas is to stay in the masjid. Stay. Not to walk through it. This is mentioned clearly in the Quran. Wala junuban illa abiri sabil. While you're in a state of Janaba, do not go to the masjid except if you are passing through. So if you're passing through the masjid, and in those days the Prophet's masjid, it would be in the middle. Many times people would have to go through or something. In this case, it is allowed to pass through if there is a need. But to sit there or to you know remain there, this is not allowed. And I realize this does raise a lot of problems for the sisters and their menses. A lot of times this question arises, I'm in my menses and I you know, want to attend this or that or in the masjid. Uh, you know, frankly, the masjid should be constructed such that there should be some type of secondary room where these type of sisters can sit. Otherwise, where the prayer takes place, really in general, it is not allowed for uh, the woman in her menses to sit there and stay there. And this is uh, the opinion of the vast majority of the ulama. Um, how does one perform ghusl? These are the factors that obligate ghusl. These, those are the factors that you need to do. If you, uh, or prohibit, or these are the factors that are prohibited during the state of Janaba. How does one do ghusl? The first act is obviously the intention. Without intention, nothing takes place in Islam. The only shart or the only rukun of ghusl is to wet the entire body. That is the only rukun. If you wet your entire body, you have done ghusl with the intention of doing ghusl. So, if you have the intention of doing ghusl and you jump into a swimming pool and then you jump out, you have done your ghusl. That's all you have to do. Your entire body must be wet. Now there is a recommended way to perform ghusl and that is what the Prophet ﷺ would usually do. The recommended way is that he would, firstly after intercourse, he would with his left hand wash his private parts. Because the private parts after intercourse have najis and filth and impurity on them. So he would wash it with his private parts, pour water over it and wash his private parts with his left hand. And then he would wash his left hand. He would hit it on the ground 
because the sand would clean it and wash his left hand to get the impurities off. In our times, we can use, for example, soap. So we wash our private part with the left hand and then wash our left hand and then he would perform a complete wudu. A normal wudu, except that he would not wash his feet at this point. He would start off by doing the entire wudu and then stop when he got to the arms and he would leave the feet. Then he would pour water over his right hand of the right half of the body and then the left half of the body. From this side he would pour water so that the right half would all become wet and then the left half and then he would wash his hair making sure that the water reached the scalp. This is important now. In ghusl, the water needs to touch the skin. Unlike in wudu because you just wipe your head. In ghusl, the water does need to touch the skin. But you do not have to make the hair soaking wet. If you make your hands wet and you rub your hand through the, your scalp until you're sure or you think that your scalp is wet, you have done your job. You don't have to soak your hair in the water. Remember in those days they would literally take a cup and just, just you know, pour it over the, the, the hair. It wouldn't be like the showers of our times. You don't have to make it soaking wet. It's sufficient that you make your scalp wet. After this, when he had made sure that every inch of his body had been touched by water, then the last thing he would do was he would walk over to another place and wash his feet. Okay, that was the last act that he would do, wash it three times. Now in our times when we have the showers, we can follow the sunnah as much as possible by you know, beginning with wudu and then washing the right, right half of our body and then the left half of our body and then washing our head. This is the sunnah, but it is sufficient just to wet the entire body. We have to be careful, brothers and sisters, that every inch of our body is wet, which means nooks and crannies all over the body. Okay. You know, between the, between the thighs, it must be wet. You know, behind the knees, okay? Even the outer buttocks, they must be wet. Inside the buttocks as well, it must be wet. If you do not make it wet, then you are not washing the entire body. So your entire body must be wet. Unless, if you do not do so, then you have not performed ghusl. Uh, performing ghusl, if you have the intention to perform ghusl, you automatically become in the state of wudu. Okay? This is a common question many people ask. I, I performed ghusl. Am I in the state of wudu? Obviously, ghusl is higher than wudu. When you reach ghusl, you're in the state of wudu. When you intend to perform ghusl, when you finish your ghusl, you have done your wudu. Okay? So, but you remember, you have to have the intention to perform ghusl. You come home from a hot day, you went, you went out jogging, for example, and you're sweaty, you want to take a shower, you jump in the shower, you come out. Then you remembered you were in a state of janaba. That doesn't count as ghusl. Why? Because you didn't have the intention to perform ghusl. You must have the intention that I am doing this to lift my state of janaba. Okay, if you take a shower to cool down without the intention that you're doing ghusl, this doesn't count as ghusl. You must have the intention before you start the act. If you do have that intention, then this makes you in the state of wudu. Okay, after, after the wudu and ghusl, we then talk about what if you don't have water? What do you do? What do you do when there is no water? Tayammum is this substitute. In Allah's mercy, He has legislated for us a substitute for wudu and ghusl. And really, subhanAllah, if you think about it, this is so beautiful. Allah Azza wa Jal could have told us in the Quran, He could have told us, if there is no water, just go ahead and pray. But in His mercy, He substituted something. Why? Because in our hearts, we would have felt dirty. Imagine in the state of Janaba and you don't have anything. In our hearts, we would have felt impure. But by legislating the substitution, Allah has given us this way out even though we don't do anything. But it is a psychologically a mercy for us that we have done this tayammu so we are spiritually pure even though physically we might still be in the state of janaba. When is tayammu performed? Performed when water is not available or there is not enough for purification or when one is not capable of using it. Three factors that allow you to perform tayammu. The first is when there is no water. You literally do not have water. You're traveling somewhere and there is no water. The second is you do have water but you need it to live. You need it to drink. And if you were to use it to do wudu, then you would die. Or you would think that you were going to go into severe hardship. This too obviously prohibits uh, or allows you to do tayammum. And the third factor is that you cannot use water. Can someone give me the example of when they cannot use water? Very sick, for example, or for example, he's had a severe burn somewhere and he cannot choose water. Okay, uh, a severe burn has affected most of his body. Okay, or is severely cold. Some of the Sahaba, when it was very cold, right, and they wake up in the state of Janaba and it's four o'clock in the morning and it's freezing cold, you're not going to go in the middle of the stream and take a shower, it might kill you. Okay, literally, it might kill you. 
So in these type of situations, you have water. Physically, you can perform. But if you do, you're worried that it will cause severe health problems. Therefore, it is allowed for you to perform tayammum. Uh, before you perform tayammum though, there must be a, a presumption that you will not find or be able to use water before the time finishes. Now suppose you're driving down the highway, okay, and it's time for dhuhr, and you don't have enough water in your car, and you're traveling between two cities. Now realistically speaking, any major highway, you will not go by half an hour or one hour except that you're going to see a rest stop. You're going to see some place where there's restrooms and toilets in this country. It is not allowed for you to stop, do tayammum, and pray dhuhr. Why? Because you know that before the timing of asr comes, you're going to find water and you can use it. Therefore, tayammum is only allowed when there is a feeling or there is a presumption. Obviously, Allah knows ilm al ghayb. There is a presumption that you will not find water before the timing finishes. If this presumption exists, then you can perform tayammum. Otherwise, you are not allowed to perform tayammum. In fact, some ulama even said that even in this case, you need to search for water. Even though you, you, you might be in the middle of nowhere, make sure that there is no water. Search for it and then perform tayammum. The point is, so practically and realistically speaking, you're not allowed to use tayammum or perform tayammum unless you think or you presume that you will not be able to uh, obtain water before the timing for prayer finishes. If you can obtain water before that timing, then you're not allowed to uh, perform tayammum. How is uh, tayammum performed? It's very easy and Allah mentions this in the Quran. You touch your hands to any sandy surface and then you wipe your hands and your face and that is your tayammum. فَمْسَحُوا بِوُجُوهِكُمْ وَأَيْدِيكُمْ مِنْ This is an ayah in the Quran. Wipe your hands and face with it. So it is symbolic. It is not a physical um, uh, yani purification. It is a symbolic purification. Again, some people they think that you have to do wudu with tayammum. They do the entire act of wudu with, you know, with sand. This is not the case. It is symbolic. You just touch your hands on the ground. Okay? You wipe your hands. And then you wipe your hands to the wrists. Not all the way to the elbows even. You wipe your hands and then you wipe your face. And that is your tayammum. Okay, so we said it is a symbolic uh, type of purification. What are the factors that nullifies tayammum? Obviously, any factor that nullifies wudu nullifies tayammum. Makes sense, because it's a substitute. Also, finding water nullifies tayammum. So suppose you perform tayammum for asr. You're still driving along. You know, you reach that rest, rest stop and it's maghrib time. Okay, you cannot pray in that same state now because you found water. So when you find water, your tayammum is broken even though you didn't do anything. But the fact that you found water now means you must do what Allah has commanded you to do, which is to use that water to do wudu or ghusl. And the tayammum is broken for every prayer. You have to do one tayammum for every prayer. So the prayer of dhuhr, if you're traveling dhuhr and asr, that's one tayammum. By the time Maghrib Isha comes, suppose you didn't find water and you didn't break your wudu, you still have to perform tayammum again because this is a concession. It doesn't lift you to the real state of wudu. So when the time comes again, you have to do the concession again. Okay? So these are the three things that break tayammum, everything that breaks wudu, everything that, uh, or, or if you find water, and if the timing for the next prayer arrives. Okay, question. Suppose you're driving down between, you know, highways, whatever, you're on a, you're on a small road, you're not on an interstate highway, you're one of these back roads, okay? And you presume or you think that you're not going to find a gas station or a rest stop or a restaurant, you know, before the maghrib timing comes. It's 4 o'clock, you have an hour and a half left. You say, I might as well pray Dhuhr and Asr. You perform Tayammum. You know, you thought you wouldn't find water. You prayed your Dhuhr and Asr. And then you started driving again. And then after half an hour, you find your rest stop. So there is water. It's still timing for Dhuhr and Asr. Do you have to repeat Dhuhr and Asr or not? The correct opinion is that you don't. Because you have done your obligation. You have done your obligation. And you feared Allah as much as you could at that time. And you presume that you could not find water. Because you're in some back roads. Remember now, I, I, realistically, I don't think on any interstate highway this would be the case. Because the interstate highways in this country uh, are, you know, so there are so many rest stops, so many restaurants, so many gas stations. I don't think that would be possible on any major highway. But if you're one of these back roads, you're going through the mountains, or one of these small, you know, um, you know, dirt roads or something, then yes, of course, it's possible you can presume that. So if you presume so, and it so happens your presumption was wrong, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, you have done your obligation and Allah Azza wa Jal has not required you to repeat your prayer at this time. Uh, we now move on to general hygiene. What are some of the aspects that every human being should do to take care of himself? Uh, firstly, 
and this has been explicitly mentioned in the Prophet ﷺ, that these are part of the fitra, these are part of uh, taking care of oneself. Firstly, to shave the pubic area and to trim or to pluck the underarm hair. Number three is to cut the nails. And these acts should be done at least a minimum of once every 40 days. This is the minimum. Anas ibn Malik narrated that the Prophet ﷺ gave us a time period of 40 days to uh, shave the pubes uh, tr 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 or pluck the underarm and to cut the nails. Now, in those days, they would literally pluck the underarm hair. Uh, it doesn't, you don't have to pluck it, alhamdulillah. You can shave it or use cream or whatever you want to do. The point is get the hair off of those areas and everybody understands the hygiene and the, you know, uh, good sense, common sense to do this, that these are areas where germs or infestations, the, you know, the filth and najasa uh, gets stored up. So you should clean this area as frequently as possible. And the maximum time limit is uh, once every 40 days. Obviously with the nails, I mean, even though that is a time limit, just as a matter of hygiene, it should be done more frequently. Also, the Prophet ﷺ encouraged us to trim or shave the mustache. Both are allowed, that you should trim or shave the mustache. And he also uh, commanded us to grow the beard. This is a part of the sunnah uh, of, of men. Uh, in fact, it is far according to the four madhabs to grow the beard. And also circumcision for the men as well. This is wajib. Circumcision is wajib. This is because the Prophet ﷺ, when a man came after having converted to Islam, he said, he commanded the man to uh, change his clothing, that was clothing of kufr, and to circumcise himself. Also, Ibrahim ﷺ, uh, circumcision, the first person to circumcise himself was Ibrahim. Before him, circumcision was, was not allowed. Uh, Allah Azza wa Jal commanded him to circumcise while he was 80 years old. So he circumcised himself with an axe while he was 80 years old. Okay, and this, the fact that he did this shows you that it is wajib. Had it been sunnah or something, and he, there's something, the sunnah or the, had it been something only mildly encouraged, I mean, this is a commandment from Allah to circumcise. So any person who accepts Islam, uh, especially in our times, there is no excuse for him not to because there is no, he will be put under you know, anesthesia or whatever and the circumcision will take place. And for, for us, when our children are born, we should circumcise them uh, as early as possible. Uh, this is a part of the obligations. If a person is not circumcised by the time he reaches puberty, then it is obligatory on him to get himself circumcised by getting it done. Um, feminine hygiene. This topic is one of the most difficult topics of fiqh, frankly. And Imam Ahmad Rahimahullah, he said, I spent nine years studying this topic. Nine years just on this one sub-chapter of the topic of Tahara before I finally managed to grasp it. Okay? And we, believe it or not, will zoom over it in 10 minutes. So you can imagine there will be a lot of gaps. We're just going to try to give you the basics and the outline and the summary. And I'm sure the sisters will have a lot of questions. And it is a very difficult topic in which there's a lot of ikhtilaf and a lot of differences. So we'll try to just summarize it to the best of my abilities. Firstly, feminine blood or the blood that comes out of women is divided into three types or three categories. Three types of blood. Firstly, menses or hayd. Okay, this is the regular cycle that most normal women have. Okay, secondly, postpartum bleeding or nifas in Arabic. This is the blood that comes after the child is born. This is the postpartum bleeding. Okay, these two are very clear, right? Three is everything else. It's very easy. This categorization is very easy. Women's blood in its entirety, any type of blood that is released from a woman's private part, is one of these three types. If it's hayd, else it's nifas, else it's istihad. Either it's the regular cycle that she has, okay, or it is the post-child uh, bleeding, or it is istihad. This is clear. The problem comes, how do you differentiate between them? This is where all the ikhtilaf comes. Nifas is easy, it's clear. When the child is born, that's nifas. How do you differentiate between hayd and istihada? This is where all of the ikhtilaf and all the questions come. Because hayd and nifas prohibits things that istihada does not. Hayd and nifas prohibits intercourse. Okay? During, this, during the menses and during the nifas, intercourse is completely forbidden. If the husband does do so, he has a penalty to pay. Uh, the second is it prohibits prayer. Both hayd and nifas. You are not allowed, the woman is not allowed to pray and she doesn't have to make up the prayer either. The third is fasting. A woman is not allowed to fast in hayd and nifas but she must make it up. She must make it up. The fourth is tawaf, obviously. Why, does this, why is this the case? Because she is in, it's like a type of janaba and obviously reciting and touching the Quran. Now, with regards to reciting the Quran, the scholars have one exception here. And that is that they, are, they state that if the woman has memorized a certain amount of Qur'an. 
and she is worried that if she doesn't recite for these days and she will forget what she has memorized, then because of the fact that it's such a great harm and hardship, she's allowed to go over what she's memorized. But the point is she should not recite the Qur'an as an act of worship. She should not recite the Qur'an just to come closer to Allah during this time. Because that state is not a state that uh, she should do that. But if she must do so in order to preserve her memorization, or some ulama also say that if she's a teacher and that is her job, she's a Qur'an teacher and that is her job and she cannot just stop during her hayd time, then in that case it is a darur or a necessity, so she's allowed to do so. Obviously, Hayd al nifas also prohibits staying in the masjid. We talked about this before. And it also prohibits divorce. A woman in her Hayd cannot be or should not be divorced. Okay? And we will discuss the fiqh of marriage and divorce, I think in our third uh, session, uh, two, three weeks from now. Istihada prohibits none of these things. Istihada prohibits none of these things. A woman in istihada, you may have intercourse with her. She must pray, she must fast. She may do the, if it's Ramadan, she may do the tawaf, recite or touch the Quran, stay in the masjid, divorce, all of this. Istihada does not prohibit anything. Istihada is a normal type of blood. Suppose you're bleeding from your arm. It wouldn't prevent you from doing anything. So too is istihada. It does not prevent anything except that it comes from that area of the woman's body. Otherwise, it is as if it's normal blood ble bleeding. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told one of the women when she described her blood, he said, this is istihada, it is only from a vein in your body. This is not hayd. This is just like a normal bleeding from your body. So istihada does not prohibit any of these things. Uh, like we said, how do we differentiate between these type of bloods? How do we differentiate particularly between hayd and istihada? This is where the ikhtilaf comes. Nifas is pretty straightforward, right? Nifas, when the child is born, that is nifas. How do you differentiate between hayd and, and, uh, and uh, istihada? Well, the first... Uh, and the most important thing is the menstrual blood has its characteristics that all the women know. Okay, so the vast majority of women, their menstrual blood is very specific. Its texture, its color, its smell, the, the, the pangs and the, the, the pain associated with it. This is a general, most of the women, they feel it. So these are signs that this is menses. Also, most women have a habit, a regular habit. They have a specific time of the month or a specific number of days in between. So when this is the case, that's easy. She goes by her habit and she goes by these signs. The nifas is even easier. The easiest thing is nifas. Because the nifas occurs as soon as uh, the child is born. Now when does a woman stop praying? This is a question a, a lot of sisters ask. Because in pregnancy, there is no hayl, okay? Any blood during pregnancy is istihada. You may write this down, it's another rule. Any blood while a woman is pregnant is istihada. There is no such thing as hayl during pregnancy. While a woman is pregnant, obviously she prays and all of the obligations of Islam are upon her. Unless she cannot fast, that's a separate issue, we'll talk about that later. But she must pray. When does she stop praying? When her delivery pains her start? No. She stops praying when the blood comes out for the first time. When her first blood is discharged. Even if it's uh, the blood of, I'm talking about of the birth. Right? Even if it's before the child comes out or after when the blood comes, that is when she stops praying. So even if she is going through her pains, of childbirth, the childbirth pains, but the blood hasn't come, she should still pray. She must still pray. In whatever state, even if she cannot do ruku sujood, then she just sits or whatever position she can, but the prayer is still obligatory on her. When the blood comes, that is the nifas. And she stops prayer and she doesn't have to make up that prayer until the blood stops or 40 days go by, the first of the two. So nifas lasts until the blood stops, or 40 days go by. If 40 days go by and she's still bleeding, this is very rare, most women stop around 30, 35, 37 days. If 40 days go by and she's still bleeding, then after 40 days, that is not counted as nifas. It becomes istihaba. Immediately it's, it's transformed from nifas to istihaba. So after 40 days, even if she's bleeding, she takes a bath, and she starts her prayer and resumes her normal life. Because that blood after that is istihada and not nifas. Going back to menstrual blood, hayd versus istihada. Suppose a woman cannot tell the difference. This is where the problem comes. She's bleeding and she's bleeding and she's bleeding. She doesn't know is this hayd or not. Okay? She's bleeding and she doesn't know if this is hayd or not. The first thing she does is she looks at her regularity. Does she have a cycle or not? 27 days, pure Seven days, menses. 27 days pure, seven days, menses, so on and so forth. 
So every Muslim woman, by the way, should write her cycle down because this comes in handy in fiqh. It comes in handy when she's in problems. It comes in handy when she needs to go to an alim and tell a situation regarding hayd and nifas. Then she can say, or excuse me, not hayd, but not nifas, but hayd and istihaba. She can say, these are my dates. Okay? She should keep some type of record, even if it's mental. So if she has a regular cycle, then she goes according to that cycle. So suppose she's bleeding continuously, but she knows that her cycle starts, let's say, on the fifth of the month, and it lasts for six days, and then after that it finishes. So she has a regular cycle, she reaches a time when she's continuously bleeding, she goes back to that cycle. So she stops praying on the fifth of the month, for six days she doesn't pray, after the sixth day, even if she's still bleeding, now she, because she's in istihada, she takes the bath and she resumes her normal life and she starts praying. So the woman who has a cycle goes back to her cycle. If she did not have a cycle and she was irregular, then what? Then she takes external signs into account. Okay. So the woman who is continuously bleeding, she goes back to her cycle. Suppose she didn't have a cycle or she didn't remember her cycle. Then she takes external signs into account. What are external signs? Circumstantial evidence, the color of the blood, the texture of the blood. The smell of the blood, the, 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 the pains and the cramps, the menstrual cramps. She takes this into account to judge to the best of her abilities, this is my menses and this is my istihaba. And she goes with that. Suppose, and this is very, very rare. Suppose she doesn't even have this. She doesn't know her cycle or she doesn't have one. And she doesn't have any external signs. The blood is all the same and it's continuous. In this case, she follows the cycle of her peers, meaning her sisters, or her friends, whoever is her closest relatives, she just goes by their cycle. If her sister menstruates on the 5th and stops on the, on, the, uh, third, on the 12th, then she too will pretend that that is her menses, and then the, when it's the 5th, she'll stop, when it's the, the 12th, she'll take a, ba a bath and start praying again. So, the one who has continual bleeding, the woman who has continual bleeding, the first thing she does is she returns to her cycle, and she follows that. Because her cycle is the strongest indication that this is her normal menses. If she doesn't have a cycle, she didn't have one, or she doesn't remember it, she takes external signs into account and this solves most of the problems. Because most women, they do have menstrual cramps or headaches or you know mood swings or um, pain or special type of blood. They take this into account and then she counts this as her menses. If even this doesn't exist, then she goes to the last resort, which is that she follows the cycle of her closest relatives, or if she doesn't have relatives, closest friends, whatever the case might be. Basically, then she just leaves it up to Allah, and she just follows the cycle of the closest, you know, female uh, around her. Uh, this is based. All of this is based on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's hadith. There are many hadith regarding istihada. When you combine them all together, uh, this is what uh, you get. This is the correct opinion, and Allah knows best regarding this. Now, the woman in istihada. What is her position with regards to salah? What must she do? Obviously, she must pray, right? Does she have wudu? Suppose she did wudu and it's the time for the next prayer. She's bleeding. Does she have wudu? No, because what was the first factor that breaks wudu? Any discharge from the private parts. And she's bleeding, so she's broken her wudu. But what is she going to do? Because as soon as she does wudu, she's still bleeding. So, the sharia has allowed her a concession. A woman came to the Prophet ﷺ and she said that I am continuously bleeding. And it was a severe amount of bleeding, so much so that she would actually have to place a bucket underneath her during prayer. That was how much she was bleeding. So the Prophet ﷺ said, tie a cloth around your private part, okay, such that it doesn't leak. Tie a cloth and do wudu, and then after this you are forgiven during the salah. After this you are forgiven. If it's continuously bleeding, then for the duration of that salah and the sunan of that salah, that wudu will suffice. But as soon as the time for the next salah comes, you should repeat your wudu. Also, the Prophet ﷺ allowed such a woman to combine between her prayers. The woman who is in istihada, continuously bleeding, it is permissible for her to combine between Dhuhr and Asr and Maghrib and Isha. And the best way to do this is by delaying the Dhuhr until the last timing of Asr, and then delaying Maghrib till the last timing, uh, excuse me, delaying Dhuhr till right before Asr, and then delaying Maghrib till right before, before Isha. So suppose uh, Asr is at 5.30. Okay, the woman in istihada should pray dhuhr at 5.20. Do wudu, pray dhuhr at 5.20. By the time she finishes, it's around 5.30, she waits. When it's 5.30, she prays asr. One wudu, sufficient.
This is another concession. No sin upon her. Same with Maghrib and Isha. Okay. The Prophet ﷺ said that every that the woman in the Sahada should perform wudu in every for every salah, but she is allowed to combine between them. So this is a brief, brief summary. Now, obviously, there's a lot of questions and a lot of issues with regards to uh, feminine hygiene. Oh, before I forget as well, like Aisha said, any discharge after the end of her menses is ignored. Now, women, uh, when their menses finish, there is a whitish discharge that happens, and that is a sign that the menses are finished. This whitish discharge or yellowish uh, discharge, when it occurs, that is a sign that the menses are finished. Sometimes some spotting occurs after this. Aisha said we used to ignore this spotting. It's nothing. Just wash yourself. You have broken your wudu obviously, but it is istihaba. It is not hayd. We used to ignore it completely. So when this whitish discharge takes place, then their hayd is broken. Until it takes place, they're in their hayd. Or one other sign that the hayd finishes, is that they may insert some cotton or something in their private part. If it comes out dry, this is a sign that their hayd has finished as well. Okay? If it comes out dry, this is another sign that their hayd has finished. When their hayd finishes, they take the bath and they resume their uh, normal life. And with that, we will conclude uh, this next session. You've reached the conclusion of this CD. Take the opportunity to evaluate yourself by going to ilmquest.org where you will find a short quiz on the content of this presentation.